Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Bristol Myers Squibb stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Bristol Myers Squibb is one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies. It manufactures prescription pharmaceuticals and biologics in several therapeutic areas including cancer, HIV, AIDS, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hepatitis, rheumatoid arthritis, and psychiatric disorders. It is involved in the discovery, development, licensing, manufacturing, marketing, distribution, and sale of biopharmaceutical products on a global basis. Its acquisitions of cell gene and myocardia will expand its oncology, hematology, immunology, and cardiovascular portfolios. It acquired cell gene in November of 2019 and myocardia in November 2020. In the pipeline, the company has dozens of drugs in phase one, phase two, phase three, and also approved drugs. The categories are hematology, oncology, immunology, cardiovascular, fibrotic diseases, neuroscience, and COVID-19. As an investor, this is what you want to see because these drugs will generate cash flow for many years into the future. 58% of phase 3 drugs get approved. 10% of phase 1 drugs end up getting approved. So it appears the company has many drugs that will get approved over the next few years. The company is headquartered in New York, New York and was founded in 1887. It started trading in 1968 and can be found on the New York Stock Exchange, Mexican Bolsa, Deutsche Börse, London Stock Exchange, Zetra, Vienna, Euro TLX, Swiss, Sao Paulo, Lima, and Buenos Aires Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 140 billion market cap. They're trading at $63 a share and they have 2.2 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see they have tons of free cash flow each year, way up to $11.7 billion. It peaked in 2020 at $13.3 billion. Free cash flow is the cash that's remaining after paying all your expenses and investing back into the business. So that's the cash left over for you, the investor. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that's positive in 18 and 19, but negative in 2020 and the trailing 12 months. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that doubles from 22.6 billion up to 44.4 billion. A big reason for the jump in sales was the acquisition of Celgene. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. So their revenue grew a ton, and a big reason was the drug Revlimid they acquired from Celgene, and that was their number one selling drug. And they added 3.1 billion of revenue from this drug from Celgene and others as well. So that was a great acquisition for the company. Also, BMY's drug Eliquis had the most sales in 2020. So that was a great year for the company. In 2020, $27 billion of their sales came from the US, 10 billion from Europe, and the rest of the sales were outside of those two areas. The company has lots of drugs in its pipeline. And some drugs become home runs like Revlimid and Eliquis. Some drugs just make a few million or a few hundred million of revenue. When you look at a drug manufacturer, you want to look at how much money they're making from their current drugs and how many drugs in their pipeline. But you also want to look at when the patents expire. And Revlimid's patent is expiring next year. So the sales from Revlimid will decrease a lot starting in 2023. When a patent expires, that doesn't mean the company can't sell the drug anymore. That just means other companies can sell the drug in generic form. So this company will still sell Revlimid, but other companies will sell generic versions of Revlimid. So there will be a lot of people that want to save money and buy the generic form. But there'll also be a lot of people willing to pay a premium just because they're used to buying this drug from BMY. Below revenue is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Cost of labor is a big cost of revenue. Overhead costs, manufacturing costs, they also have to pay profit sharing and royalties to third parties that help distribute or develop the drugs. When they acquire intangible assets from acquisitions, the amortization charges goes in the cost of revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. That peaked in a trailing 12 months at $34 billion. Below that is operating expenses. Salary and marketing are a big operating expense for this company. And you can find that in selling general and administrative expenses. 
Of course, research and development expense is big for this company. That includes preclinical and clinical drug development, drug formulation and medical support, salary and benefits for its employees. They also pay third-party grants and fees to clinical research organizations. Below that is depreciation and amortization. That's a non-cash item. And they do have positive operating income each year, so that's good. They do have quite a bit of debt on their balance sheet, so they paid $1.4 billion of interest on their debt. And they do have negative net income in 2020 and the trailing 12 months, but positive in 2018 and 19. But I would focus on operating income when I look at the income statement, not net income. Research and development is an expense that brings down your net income and also reduces your tax bill. But when they acquired Myocardia, they passed through an $11.4 billion research and development expense. And this is from their 10K, and that's a non-deductible expense. So it does bring down their net income, but it does not lower their taxes. This is from the company's 10K. So you can see 42.5 billion of revenue. So it does match Yahoo Finance, 42.5 billion. And the net loss is 9 billion. Same thing in Yahoo Finance. But sometimes when Yahoo Finance puts all the details into their categories, it doesn't exactly fit right. In the 10K, they report an IPRD charge from the myocardial acquisition. IPRD is in process research and development. And this 11.4 billion must be hidden somewhere in the other income and expense item on Yahoo Finance. It can get a little confusing, so I would just focus on operating income and cash flow from operations on a statement of cash flows. That's a much better indicator of how the company's doing than net income, especially when you acquire a lot of companies because companies pass through lots of write-offs when they acquire companies. Sometimes they pass through those write-offs the year they acquire them. Sometimes they pass through the write-offs five or 10 years after they acquire them. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. So you can see they generate so much operating cash flow, even though they reported negative net income. That's why you should really look at the statement of cash flows because the income statement can be really confusing. Although some videos, the operating cash flow section was deceiving and net income was a better indicator. I know that makes your job even more confusing, but generally speaking, operating cash flow is usually a better indicator than net income. So with their two new acquisitions, mainly Celgene, they're generating tons of cash flow. And they also have a good amount of CapEx, 750 million up to 950 million. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And free cash flow is a cash that's remaining for you, the investor. So the company can buy back stock, which helps you. And they do that each year, 320 million, 7.3 billion, 1.5 billion, 4.5 billion. When they buy back stock, that decreases the shares outstanding, making your shares more valuable. Also with free cash flow, they could pay you a dividend, which they do, it's over 3%. And they did buy back a lot of stock in the trailing 12 months since they had so much free cash flow, but they added a lot of debt in 2019 and 2020, 27 billion and 6.9 billion. This is to fund the acquisitions from Celgene and Myocardia. In order to fund acquisitions, a company can use the cash in its bank account. If it doesn't have much cash, they can issue debt or issue more stock. When a company issues stock, that dilutes you to shareholder. But when a company issues debt, it is still diluting you just in a different way. Anytime a company does not use free cash flow to pay a dividend or buy back stock, that money is diluting you because it's not going to you. This is the equity section of their balance sheet. They have 37 billion of equity. They raised 44 billion from issuing stock and they generated 22 billion of profit. Retain earnings is a sum of all your prior net incomes minus a sum of all the dividends you paid. And they do report treasury stocks, so they bought back $28 billion of stock. Treasury stock is a contra equity account, so you actually minus this amount to come up with your stockholders' equity. Let's look at the capital structure, $37 billion of equity, $46 billion of debt. They're 44% equity, 56% debt. Their net debt is $32 billion, so they do have a lot of cash on their balance sheet. And their weighted average cost of capital is 6.8%, and that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 237 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $215 billion. We divide that by 2.2 billion shares. 
and we get a calculated stock price of $97. They're trading at $63, so they're trading at a 35% discount. It's a strong buy according to the model. The analyst forecast is for their revenue to grow 2.9%. So their revenue grew more than 2.9% from 2020 to the trailing 12 months. To calculate that 2021 revenue, I grew their trailing 12 month revenue 2.9% and then 2.9% a year after that. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. To calculate their future free cash flows, I needed to see what percent of revenue was converted to free cash flow. So I summed all the free cash flow numbers, these four numbers, I divided by these four revenue numbers, and that's 27%. So they convert 27% of their revenue on average to free cash flow. I thought that was a bit high, so I lowered it to 20%. So I multiplied the revenue numbers by 20%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. And I'm still coming out of the stock price a lot higher than they're trading at. So it seems like a really undervalued stock. Simply Wall Street is a lot higher than me. They're at 197 a share. They're saying the stock is 68% undervalued. Seven analysts priced this stock and the average price target was $76. This is where the stock has been trading since 1984. It was doing really well from 1997 to 2001. And this stock dropped a lot in the dot-com boom. And then it was pretty steady for a while. Even during the Great Recession in 2008, the stock really didn't dip too much. But when the whole market started coming up in 08, and it shot way up to about $70 a share, and it's been pretty flat since then, there was a dip in the coronavirus crash, but it came right back up and it's trading almost at its peak right now. This is a candlestick chart the last 12 months. The D is for dividend. Generally, a stock comes down the same percentage as the dividends it pays. So that's why there's usually a dip when there's a D. But overall, the stock has been going up. It did regress about 10% the past few weeks, but it is trading a little higher than it was 52 weeks ago. But it does trade in a pretty tight range. There's not much volatility with this stock. They're a really good dividend payer. They raise their dividend every year. It's up to 49 cents. They pay a 3.1% dividend yield. To calculate the dividend yield, you could just multiply the last dividend payment by four, take that number, and divide by the stock price. We can't look at that payout ratio since they have negative net income due to all those write-offs. But if you want to figure out that payout ratio, you could just manually strip out those write-offs and then recalculate it. They pay out 37% of their free cash flow, so they do have lots of cash left over to even pay a larger dividend or to buy back stock or to pay down debt. Their industry pays a 2.6% dividend, so they're higher than their industry. Analysts are forecasting them to raise their dividend to 3.4%. And they have a really low beta, 0.59, so the stock is not too volatile. It's only gone up 8% the past 52 weeks, while the S&P went up 34%. The 52-week low was 57, the high was 70. And the stock is on a decline, trading below its 200-day and 50-day moving average. About 9 million shares are traded each day on this stock. Of the 2.22 billion shares outstanding, 2.1 billion are on float. 75% of the shares are held by institutions, and under 1% of the shares are shorted. These are the total shares shorted in the past 52 weeks. It peaked at 28 million shares in February. It's come down to 19 million shares. The stock is up the past year, three years, and five years, but it's doing worse than its industry and the market. Analysts are forecasting their earnings to grow 31%, their revenue to grow 3%. If you put $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd have $29,000 today. That's a pretty solid 11% annual return. The biggest shareholder is Vanguard at 9%, then BlackRock, State Street, JP Morgan, and Fidelity. Let's look at their financial ratios. We can't look at the PE because they have negative net income. They have a good price to sales of 3.2, a good price to book of 3.8. They have $69 billion of intangible assets on their balance sheet from all the acquisitions they do. So that gives them negative tangible book value. They do have a low return on invested capital of 3.5%. In the long term, you can survive as a business if your ROIC is lower than your WAC. For a given year or two, it's fine. So you should keep an eye on this number. Their interest coverage ratio is on the lower side, but it's above two, so it's okay. Negative ROE since they have negative net income. They have a good current ratio and quick ratio. They have lots of cash on their balance sheet, 14 billion and 11 billion of receivables. So they seem to be more than well capitalized. They had 11.7 billion of free cash flow. Just amazing how big of a number that is. 10 billion of working capital and they pay out 4.4 billion of dividend payments. So they have $17.5 billion of funding. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of 15 other companies in the same industry as BMY. And if BMY has number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So we can't look at the PE, 
They have a really good price to sales and price to book. They do have a good current ratio, a negative ROE. They're pretty much average in debt. And they're a really big company, 140 billion market cap, which is a little bigger than average. And they pay a nice dividend, 3.1%, which is a little higher than average. A big barrier to entry is when you see an industry with such a high average market cap. When the average company has over $100 billion in market cap, it just makes it really difficult to penetrate this industry. It's so expensive to start a drug development company. You have to pay yourself a salary, your employees a salary. You probably need to rent a location and buy some equipment. And you may have to pay all those expenses for 10 years without any revenue coming in because it could take at least 10 years to develop a drug and get it approved. So you may need hundreds of millions of dollars just to start up, not to even compete with these guys, just to start up. You can compete with Amazon. Of course, you're not going to beat Amazon, but you could sell things online. It doesn't cost that much money to get a website and to buy some products, maybe even a few thousand dollars. And maybe you can grow and scale and become big one day. But just to even start a drug development company, it takes an enormous amount of money and a lot of knowledge. So it's something to think about when you invest in a company like this, the barriers to entry, which is a positive thing when investing in a company, an industry that's hard to break into. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 35% discount. This company brings in tons of revenue and tons of free cash flow. And they have so many drugs in the pipeline, which is an important thing to look at when you invest in a company like this. I would have no idea how to analyze whether a drug will make a lot of money or not. Even people at this company probably don't have a great idea either. I'm sure they have some sense whether a drug will be really popular or not so popular, but I'm sure there's lots of drugs that have surprised them that have made billions and billions of dollars and other drugs that were developed and approved have become duds. The only thing I could look at is a number of drugs in the pipeline. And that's a good indicator when investing in a company like this. If you look at a company like Moderna, which has a larger market cap than this company, 181 billion market cap, and the only drug that was ever approved by the company was their COVID vaccine, you can see their revenue down here. In 2019, it was only $60 million. In 2020, it was under 1 billion. This company is 20 billion up to 44 billion. It's so much better of a company to invest in, but Moderna is so overvalued because of the COVID vaccine. And they did have 7 billion of revenue in the trailing 12 months, so their revenue is going up a lot. But there's going to be a point where enough people have received a vaccine or have gotten COVID, so they're immune to COVID from that. Unless they develop more drugs, I don't see where Moderna is going to go. So the only thing you could look at is how many drugs in the pipeline. Moderna has hardly any drugs in the pipeline. This company has a ton of drugs. I ranked their free cash flows 8 out of 10, their revenue 9 out of 10, and their ratio is 5 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.